Ben Price Live at Home is back and also available on demand. Wait, a case of Corona? And I get to sit here on the couch and watch TV for two whole months and do nothing. Woohoo! It's so exciting. <laughs> I've been to the future. I've seen the war on the machines. It's nothing compared to the war on toilet paper, trust me. I had the uh, Corona virus recently, and it was, uh, I, I saw my doctor, he said, you uh, you look pasty, uh, your hair's all over the place, uh, you're, you're incoherent, you're trying to think of words to say. I said, good, I'm back to normal, great. <laughs> uh, have you seen the folk getting toilet paper out there? Somewhere out there, a village is missing its idiot. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're doing homeschool online and it's it's great. You know, we're getting to sleep in and, uh, uh, and they're doing really well. They're getting like A plus, 100% on most things, just about everything. And it's, I'm a little bit concerned when they do go back, like who's going to give them all the right answers then? <laughs> yeah. We had a great time watching it, laughed all the way through the Impressions were spot on. Go watch it. It's highly, highly recommended. Matt, it was awesome. Recommend this. Go watch it. Do yourself a favor. Watch Ben Price live at home. For tickets, go to benpricecomedy.com. Hi, John Traver here at Traver Connect. Thanks for joining us on our Service BDC video today. If you've already partnered with us, we appreciate your partnership over these past years. If you're new to us, we look forward to getting to hear your story and come alongside you relative to Service BDCs. When you hear the term Service BDC, the first word for me that comes to mind is calls. That's what really a Service BDC is going to be built around, both inbound and outbound calls. Those calls are going to load your shop, it's going to drive your RO count, and ultimately, it's going to tee up your next retail unit. One reason the Service BDC is so successful today, so important today, is it has a massive amount of opportunity in the form of those incoming calls. The cell phone changed everything, it's increased the amount of calls to dealerships, and as a result, we have to have a team of people centralized to take those calls. It's always been busy in service, but today when you ask dealers, they tell you they need help. With only three service routers, it's virtually impossible for my service routers to load the shop effectively and efficiently in order to keep my shop full. The second thing I'd be thinking about if I were you is what do my calls sound like? What is our statement of work in those calls? Are we asking for email, address, phone number? Do we use a time and mileage approach to make sure we're pre-selling to any additional needs or are we just order taking and then trying to take care of the customer when they get there and tell them we need their car all day? So what you wanna do is establish a clear roadmap for how your calls are going to be handled. We'll help you do that whether it's virtually here through our BDC or we do it with your team at your dealership. So perhaps you're like some dealers, when they hear us talk about centralizing the calls here in Dallas, Texas, they wonder what that call might sound like. One thing I like about Traver is that my customers feel as though they're dealing with someone within my own store. I've had several customers come to my store and ask to speak to Chelsea when my people that realize Chelsea doesn't work there, she actually works in the call center uh, in Dallas. I have you scheduled you. for the recall. Was there anything else? Let me tell you, you're like the most professional person I've ever spoken to, I think. My Good pleasure. Job. Thank you. No, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm not, I'm being completely serious. That was, no, we don't need anything else. That was great. You have a wonderful day. Okay, and you're doing a great job. You sound good on the phone. So oh, when I see when I see Herb, I'll tell him he's a great person on the phone. We're built for service BDCs. Sixty thousand square feet of workstations and personnel trained to take inbound calls. There's a handful of ways we can help you. We can help you with a virtual service BDC where we take your calls. We can help you with outbound campaigns, filling in those open spots in your schedule, turnkey, not just getting the customer to call, but actually taking the call and loading it in your scheduler. Three, training for your business development manager, for your business development rep. Uh, how do they take these calls? We'll bring them into our customer experience center if, if they're a BDM, or we'll provide online training for those BDRs. Leadership education for you. You're wondering, what are my KPIs? What should my staffing plan be? We can walk you through this in less than a day. And then tools, everything from texting, mobile payments, even in dealership software to help your BDRs. So hopefully you see we're built for service BDCs. This is what we do, not what we talk about. And we hope to be talking to you soon. days 
when booking our tour buses was like battling a wildebeest. Then we found the peaceful calm of the BDC at Traver Connect. John Traver, the sound of the Jumanji jungle is saying you're next at the Fix Stops Roundtable. John, you made it. Welcome to the Fix Stops Roundtable, the Jumanji Jungle. <laughs> it's a wild world, man. Gene, Ted, so good to be with you guys. The setting is a little different here, though. Uh, what's up with the jungle? <laughs> hey, John, we thought we'd have some fun today because this has been a kind of a Jumanji type of year. Would you agree? Not uh, knowing what's going to come next, what beasts, what tigers, what lions, what crocodiles could come out. So... Yeah. We figured we'd close the year on a high and have some fun in the process. Yeah, Ted, you couldn't have said it better. You're absolutely right. It's been a wild ride this year. I'm excited to be here, excited to talk about what we're going to talk about today. John Traver, everyone, is the CEO of Traver Connect, great friend of the Fixed Ops Roundtable, a fixture of the Fixed Ops Roundtable as well. And uh, John, we're honored to have you back with us again today. And you know, you, you constantly take our conferences and elevate them a couple notches each time and everyone looks forward to to hearing you speak so uh with that i'm going to thank you and i'm going to go ahead and turn the show over to you well ted it is our shared pleasure honestly here at traver connect we're excited to be here and we're here for our dealer body we're excited to talk about this jumanji kind of year and you know a, a couple weeks ago gene and i had a call and man gene does so much behind the scenes for us he is uh, he is such a big part of these shows, I know. And and uh, this was an editing piece he had done recently, I believe. So Gene and I start talking about leadership and the changes we're seeing in the industry. And the question really that I posed to Gene is I said, you know, do you feel like it's more important to do things right or to do the right things? And he and I shared an answer. And then he did a poll, and you may have seen that poll, but it really came down to being efficient, right? Efficient essentially is doing things right. When you think of service and you think about all the steps and what we have to do to effectively put a car back out on the street without a comeback, there's a huge emphasis on doing things right or doing it correctly. But there is another way to look at things. And the other way would be being effective. But see, when you're effective, sometimes you're not always going to do things exactly right, but you're going to really be focused on prioritization, on doing the right things. And so that got me thinking, about this month's message here in early December as we wrap up a 2021, uh, uh, 2020 and think about 2021. I'm that lathered up. I couldn't wait to start talking 2021. So one of the easy ways to do that is to look back, right? And you look back at the trend, not just in the last year, but the last seven. And the last seven, the first thing I would tell you is we know service is the new sales. We're up and to the right. As a revenue number, NADA data shows us we're growing in this space and it's exciting. But if you just look at a trend and you don't look for the change in the trends, you might miss the real story. So I want to show you a few things really quick. Number one is your challenge isn't necessarily going to be competition in terms of the amount of dealers around you, because over the last six, seven years, the amount of dealers you can see is still about 16,000. So I would call that in the U.S. pretty much unchanged. But the RO count has changed. In 2015, we hadn't yet pierced 300 million ROs in the US, but by 2016, we crushed it. We bumped a little bit in 17, lost a little bit of ground in 18, started to make up ground in 19, and there we are at June, year to date, at 125 million in 2020. So what about what's inside those ROs? You got customer pay at 265 in 2015, going all the way to 329. And then you got warranty pay at 273 running up to 385. So what's being spent in an RO is up and to the right. The blended average goes from 269 to 357. Again, this is all makes all models, not luxury, not import, not domestic, but blended. So keep that in mind. So you say, okay, where am I at in the grand scheme of things? Well, in six years, gang, we're talking about a third growth. If you were a thousand RO store, you're a 1500 RO store just because you existed. But you see, the thing is, is that not doesn't really speak to your potential. 
that really speaks to what's happened in the market. You're in the right place at the right time, kind of riding that wave. Just in the last year alone, on the RO itself, about a 9% lift. So what one thing I do want to call out is that 125 million, though, at the half year marker, if you multiply that by two, that's 250. Now, I'm not a math major, but the last time I checked, 250 is less than 300. So there's about 60 million repair orders that didn't happen this year. So either they're happening somewhere else around you or they're still out there and they're going to happen sometime here as we walk into 2021. So with that, I wanted to get you prepared. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. So the very first one, I remember this piece from Peter Drucker. He said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mark Fields at Ford back in 08, he rode this hard. And I would agree that culture does eat strategy for breakfast, lunch, and maybe even dinner. So when you think about culture, what culture are we talking about in your dealership, in your fixed ops department? I think we're talking about really, do you have a bent towards customer service? Let's start there. Is your, customer, is your culture a customer service culture? How would I know, John? Well, here's how you'd know. Number one, you're responsive. You probably focus on being helpful. Most of it's reactive. If the customer asks, then do this. You focus on CSI scores. Not a bad thing. Definitely customer service oriented. The opposite of that would be customer experience oriented. And that focus is going to look a little different. It's not so much responding, although you do have that. It's more perceiving anticipating what's going to happen next. What is the customer thinking? What are they feeling? What will they experience? And, and so it's more proactive. You're perceiving their needs in advance and you're building out a workflow for them that experientially is going to cause them to do business with you over and over and over. So I guess the question is really, what's the is, is the sky the limit and how high is the sky, right? What is your potential? Have you thought about asking that question to your team? You know, it, it, when you look at who you are as the kitty, if you will, in the mirror and you see the cougar, the, the, the mountain lion, the tiger, you know, the potential is greater. We all agree with that. You say, John, can you put this in context for me? Well, sure. I mean, you know, do you have a net promoter score? And if you don't, get educated. Start there. Retention percentages of the units that you've sold that are in your market. We're spending over $600 a unit to retail a new vehicle in our advertising cost alone. What is our retention? And, and so the list kind of goes on. So what I would do is I would do this as a drill with, with my team if I were you. And I would say, where do we stand now? And what is our potential? So once you do that, then the question is, how do we get there? And I think that question is answered with this. There's this journey that the customer has. It starts on the phones. 70% of your ROs are going to start on the phones. Have you addressed the phones? And then you got pick up and deliver. We've had Brian Benstock with us multiple times on the roundtable speaking to his journey with pick up and deliver. Then you have the lane experience. What happens when they get there? Is it a kiosk? Is it a human being? What's that like? Texting updates with artificial intelligence, mobile payments, uh, and then loading the shop for that next appointment. I guess what I'm saying to you is this. If you want to maximize, if you're willing to maximize your customer experience, you can discover what your maximum potential is. If you closed every day, with two words in your mind, knowing that everybody in your organization was driving overwhelming value. You know what? You'd wake up each day knowing you were going to conquer because you're not worried about CSI scores if you're driving CX like this. Does that make sense? Now, the reason it doesn't happen is because we start like this too often. We put the small stuff in first and we're so focused on being efficient that when it comes time to being effective, there's no room for the big rocks. The big rocks have to go in first, gang. You got to start there first. So as you walk into 2021, be thinking about what are the big rocks? What does the customer want? If I make it right there, everything else falls together. Now, just because I say it doesn't mean it's true. So what I thought I'd do is kind of shed some light on a half a dozen that I just highlighted and show you what that would look like if you're doing it. So first of all, the phones. I only got to say the phones and you know what we're talking about right away. 
We know we miss one out of four to one out of five calls in service, yet three quarters of the calls hitting the switchboard are coming to service. No wonder. Our hold times, guys, they're, it's over a buck 30 industry-wide. And, and the average RO we know already is a $350 plus RO. So the average store is missing five to 10 calls a day. Nobody would disagree. But if we just said, hey, let's just say it's just three, just three. There's nobody on the planet that would disagree with that. That's a thousand bucks a day. It's 23 grand a month. It's over a quarter million bucks a year. Your BDC solutions got to start here because this is where the party starts. Then you got to pick up and deliver. And I just want to highlight a few things. I learned a few things from Brian virtually this year, watching him on his journey. First of all, let's remember, we as customers will pay for the experience. We pay for Amazon Prime. Customers will pay for Walmart Plus. We'll pay for a Netflix subscription. And there's a wow factor to the pick up and deliver. But the thing about Brian's story that's so cool is he tells you about sort of the warts on the deal too. And what I mean by that is I love when he talks about servicing somebody's car and the wrong car being delivered back to the customer. Now, if you think customer service you know, you're going to be afraid to try pick up and deliver. But if you think big rocks first and you think customer experience, you know, you're going to screw up sometimes. Brian knew that. You know what? He's thinking effective. He's thinking big rocks. He's thinking, what does the customer want? We'll figure out the mistakes afterwards and refine it. We'll own it. Then you got the lane experience. So in the lane experience, when you take the calls out of the drive, you're giving the advisors about two hours a day back to interact with customers. That's what they're there to do, right? The return on time, the ROT is a half hour per RO. Today's labor rate is a buck 31 nationally per NADA through June. Half of that's 65 bucks. A thousand RO store at a half hour is 65 grand a month. I think we can figure out how to put that money to work. That's what time does. It gives them time to listen. It gives them time to sell. It gives them time to load a shop properly, update customer info, all those things. That's what the lane experience now can be can, can experience. And then you have texting updates with AI. I want to touch on this because status calls are going to handcuff you. The volume of status calls back to your BDCs, that's crazy. You can solve it with texting. And so the customer wants the updates. You realize that, right? They don't want to call. And AI is what is in place when your advisors don't use the tool. Sometimes we buy tools, our people don't use it. Probably not your store, but maybe a store near you somewhere on the planet, right? It happens. But AI can help you begin to fill in those gaps. Our friends at Update Promise have an incredible application that does this and drives it. And they've filled in the gaps. All I'm saying to you as a teammate is this is no longer a knowing problem. It's a doing problem. This is what they want. Look, Domino's Pizza in 2010 was a $7 stock. In 2020, it's 387 bucks last night. It's a $5,000 increase. I'll show you in a sec. With all the only change they made, you guys, is a pizza tracker. That's it. The customer's in tune with their pizza being born, cooked, and delivered, and they want the same with their car. Mobile payments. Don't make them go to the glass. If you want something new in this space, you got to stop doing stuff that's old, right? So what do you do? You give them touchless. I don't want to touch the dirty point of sale machine. I'd rather touch my dirty iPhone, right? Text the payment to them. Make it, make yourself current, make it easy for them. And then load the shop with next. Now, I just want to tell you, some of you guys have automated this and that's a good start, but I would say layer in the human outreach because you're going to need it. And if you don't, you're not going to get your share. And then add texting invites. The dentist has beat us to the space. They kill it, right? And then day one mentality. You go, John, we've done this. Good, do it again. And do it again and do it again because you, there's no way you can be there in this area here until everybody that we sold that still lives in our, our market is servicing with us, we're not there. So to me, it's that refreshing approach like how can we get better? So I just want to take a couple minutes to touch on that. So just so you know, I don't make this stuff up. This is Domino's Pizza, an article on how they became what they would call a tech stock. And they're really just a flour and vegetable and meat company. Here's Domino's stock up 5,000%. And here's Friday's stock price at 389. I just want to let you know they're down two bucks yesterday. It's crazy because all they did was add the pizza tracker. They thought about the experience and they've connected with the customer. So, if you want 
if you have maximum CX, then you have a chance next year to start achieving your maximum potential. The phones, that's going to be your BDC. Pick up and deliver. You're going to have to be willing to risk, risk it to get the biscuit, as they say. The lane experience, there's your return on time. Updates with AI going back, getting rid of status calls in the BDC, we give them the pizza tracker. Time to pay, we're not going to make them go to the counter, we'll still offer it, but we're going to go mobile where they can be touchless. Active deliveries, now we can actually thank them and let them know what we did. That's return on time, showing up again by taking calls out of the drive. And the next appointment, BDC. To me, if you want to reach your potential, you're thinking about these touch points and you're saying, look, we're going to be frictionless. If you want to be effective, you got to do the right things first. That's what it's going to take. And we think we can help you, whether it's just advice or it's education or it, whatever. We're here to help. But at the end of the day, we want to see you win. So, Ted, Gene, to reach your potential, man, that's what it's going to take. What do you guys say? John, if I, I wrote this down. It's a quote. If you want something new in this space, stop doing something old. Yeah, just a little lathered oh, up. Sorry. Yeah. Sometimes this stuff just falls out and I almost forgive me. But no, I'm <laughs> passionate about it. I believe in our retail space. We have an incredible opportunity. What you guys have done with Fixed Ops Roundtable in one year, happy anniversary, um, is crazy. But the timing is right. But now we gotta we gotta go about this, put the big rocks in first. And these tools you're talking about are intuitive and, you know, going back to the CX and, you know, look at other experiences, you know, that come to mind, the, the four seasons, they, they anticipate the customer, what the customer is going to need ahead of time. And we're now able to do the same thing with the technology that you've got in place and some of the things that you've been pointing out. So, Man. and so Man. thank right you, Ted. On, you know, it's on, a pleasure. John, we are always honored to be part of the event and, Excited to see it growing, and uh, we look forward to a very bright future. John, how do we uh, how do we reach you if someone in our audience wants to get a hold of hold of Traver? Hey, TraverConnect.com, and right there on that bottom line, you can you can call us. I think we have my direct line in there, so I'll do the best I can. But uh, we're, we got a team of people here, Bob Gower, his crew. And we would look forward to hearing what you're up against and helping you walk through the process. A giant in this business, everyone. John Traver from Traver Connect here at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Hey, I have a question. How do I get out of this place? Well, I'm hearing the sound of drums right now, John, and that means that the only way to get you back to yep. Traver Connect and to Texas is for you to say the words. Yeah. Jumanji! Ted and Jean, we found our way safely through many uncharted areas of the Jumanji jungle. But now we've come to a place we're told no one has gone before. No, it's not outer space, you crazy Trekkies. It's an abandoned mine. And who better to help navigate the depths of the dark caves than the auto miner himself? The drums are beating for you, Aaron Sheeks, and your colleague, Lisa Copeland. Well, welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable, everyone. I'm Gene Girdley, along with Ted Ings, and we are so thrilled to have at Jumanji, Aaron Sheeks and Lisa Copeland. We're so honored today to be joined by um, Aaron Sheeks, who's the president at the Auto Miner, which does Fixed Ops data mining, marketing, and advertising for this segment on the impact of follow-up in your Fixed Ops department. And we are honored as well to be joined by Lisa Copeland of Lisa Copeland Global Enterprises. Lisa Copeland, also a former retail dealer, extremely well known in the automotive industry, recipient also of the Walter P. Chrysler Award for Sales and Service Excellence. Aaron and Lisa, welcome to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you. You know, we've been looking forward, uh, Aaron and Lisa, to this segment for some time because you've got some unique technology that uh, you're now deploying on the fixed op side of the business that we haven't had before. And our audience is always here to learn about the latest technology. So with that, Aaron and Lisa, take it away. The show is yours. 
Well, I think I'm going to kind of come out with, Aaron, it has been so fun to watch you. How long have you and I known each other now? 10 years? We're coming up on 10 years, I think. Coming up on 10 years. I still remember the night we met and you had just gotten out of the military. And I thought you were really one of the sharpest, uh, hardworking, you know, really wanted to absorb the business. And so just to watch your journey over the last 10 years has been phenomenal. Thank you. It's You're always uh, entirely too kind. And, uh, and look, it's been a pleasure. I've gotten the chance to learn from you and learn from some of the best. And uh, it's just great to be included with smart folks. So thanks for joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting me because, you know, you are speaking about something that's really near and dear to my heart. And that is what I would like to call the art of follow up, mm -hmm. especially in how important it is in the fixed ops department. Because, you know, you hear about it in sales and, you know, did you follow up with your lead? Did you do this? Did you do that? And, you know, owning a retail car dealership. But where is the follow-up? Where is the art of the follow-up in the sales and service department? How many people do you think, sales and service, going to be service and parts department, how many people do you think get away because nobody ever followed up with them? Look, I think uh, near and dear to your heart and mine, as salespeople, I think it's bred into us. We understand the importance of follow-up. It's a huge piece of our business driving forward, reaching back out to folks and bringing them back to us. Uh, and I think a lot of that is lost sometimes on the service department, not necessarily because they don't want to follow up or because we don't want to communicate with folks, but resources are thin and human beings to do that follow up is sometimes limited. So we have to have a structured plan in place, whether that's a, an organizational or a BDC or a team put in place to do so, or if it's a, a technology that we're hoping to fill that void. I think for the sake of today's conversation, and it's always good to go back and forth with you is, is I think there's really three really main reasons or key ways to be effective with follow-up in the service department. And I agree. So I want to break it down for everybody because the goal of this uh, segment, of course, would be is that uh, our audience could walk away with three takeaways that they could take back to their service department for success. So what what is number one to you? What is the first thing that a service and parts department, you know, fixed ops needs to do to successfully start building a follow-up funnel? Mm -hmm. um, or just even even a, a, a procedure? Like, you know, what is it they need to do? Sure, I, I think the first and foremost, you have to have a plan. So before you put anything into place, what is your plan and what are your resources and how can we get there effectively? Uh, I think the service side of the back, you know, the fixed inside of the house sees more customers, touches more folks, allows us to share our culture and our community of our dealership brand with those folks. And there's really three, I think, key ways of structuring it. The first, it, it seems fairly obvious, but not a lot of folks are set up this way, is to have a full-blown service BDC. Right. You know, a lot of our friends, my good buddy, Chris Martinez and several others have high performing, really large, high volume service BDCs that just crush it. I think that's a really effective way. Um, I also know that having a, a service BDC allows us, you know, to hold some salesperson metrics in that fixed stop side, whether those are daily activities, outbound phone calls, emails, text messages. Up the service writers, because I think that so many times that they get busy being busy and I get it. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a very high volume sales department for as small as my sales department was, my service department, you know, we serviced all of uh, Central Texas from San Antonio to Waco and everywhere in between. So, you know, it was very high volume. And, and I would find that my service writers would get so busy being busy sometimes that a lot of things fell through the cracks. So I know that you probably have a solution for that. No, I think I think that's the, the first goal is it, it is understanding that you have those cracks and how do we start to fill them? So does our service BDC, do we man that and, you know, to a point that I can scale with those increased ROs, despite how big or small my sales team maybe is, maybe it needs to be bigger on that end. Uh, I think the second is to your point, service advisors tend to get buried or busy or the phone's always ringing. Right. So do we, do we find a hybrid model? between a full-blown service BDC, and I'm going to include outsourced BDCs in this service BDC list here, is, is even if they're on-site or they're off-prem and an off-site you know, off BDC, I think it could still fill that gap. Uh, do you have a hybrid model somewhere in the middle there where, Aaron, you know, maybe I got one person, I've got a really smart tech advisor, I've got a, I've got a service advisor of the year is what I like to call them, that they, they talk to the customers, they greet the customers, they do walk arounds, they do all the important things in the service side, and then still somehow manage to leverage some software or some technology to be really effective. And then I think the third reason, and of course, we'll circle back here, um, and part of where my, you know, my kind of expertise lies is how do we put a software or a tool in place that is, that is quick, easy to use at the dealership level or turnkey, because we know those folks are busy and they don't have the opportunity to do it. How do we allow software or technology to come in place to fill those cracks for us to do a lot of this outbound communication? 
And I think the secret is, is finding a way to fill those effectively in our business and what fits the right mold for us, but to also make it as automated or as less, you know, the least amount of touch as possible. Um, yeah, I agree. And you know, but what I found and help me with this is that you know, we would employ some of the greatest technology, but if, if nobody uses it, right, you can have it, you can subscribe to it, you can pay for it, you bring in the teams to set it up. And then you look up as a general manager or as a dealer principal, and you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> nobody's using it because, you know, people tend to be afraid of technology. So what would you say to that, to that service department out there where the service manager has been there for 20 years, the service writers have been there for 10 years each, and we're like, we don't need this stuff. We're good. Yeah. So your uh, number one question I get every single day in, in, in my line of work is, is Aaron, I'm, I love it. I love you. I, I think if I put it in place, maybe it's works and then I'm going to cancel it in 90 days because my people maybe aren't going to log into it or aren't going to adopt it or right. aren't going to continue my vision. It's all about adoption with anything, right? Which it's is what Bill Gates talked about. You can build the greatest profit or, or product in the world, but if nobody adopts it, what do we do? No, 100% right. I think the one thing that always comes back to me, and I'll steal this line, is that this device right here, the greatest device maybe ever created, allowed Apple to roll it out to how many millions of people without a training manual, without, okay. without anywhere to teach these people how to use it, right? So mm -hmm. our job as innovators and as tech disruptors really is to is to create something and put something in place at a dealership that not only requires no little or zero training, but is also allowed to be as impactful or as effective in our stores and in our business as possible. So my goal is to say, maybe you're, maybe the answer is a full-time BDC. And maybe that BDC needs to leverage really smart, either data mining or advertising or text messaging or social or whatever tool you want to bolt on there. Maybe it is getting that one or two rock stars inside the building to own it. Or maybe you have someone that says, I don't have time to own it, but I can give some direction to somebody else. Or maybe it's Aaron I'm a small guy in the middle of nowhere like me. And I live in, I live outside the city. I've got two reps. I've got service fighters buried, but I know that I've got to get retention is up. And I know I have to get in front of my customers and I have to follow up with these folks to be really effective in bringing them back in. How can I have effective follow-up if I don't have the people and I know that my people won't adopt it. So I, no matter what the tool is, whether it's being managed in house or it's being managed out of house, I think that in today's day and age, you have to have a level of automation. You do. You do. And, and do you have the ability to be able to help a dealer manage out of house? Like, so is, is there, you know, do you have the ability to be able to manage uh, remotely the their service BDCs or, remanage, or manage remotely their follow up systems? I, look, I think there's I think there's a lot of great tools out there. Of course, I have one uh, and, and I would love to talk uh, to anyone who'd like to talk about mine. But I think the most is not why we're on here today. No, not today. I'm going to do a little <laughs> more teaching today than normal. Uh, but, you know, of course, I think my tool is as good as any out there that that allows us to schedule and automate either pre-survey, post-survey, appointments that are scheduled for tomorrow. Maybe they purchased two weeks from us or, or 30 days from us. And I wanna make sure that I get a, a follow-up message in front of them before their first scheduled service appointment. And I want it to be, hey, this is Lisa Copeland. I'm so thankful that you purchased from me and I'm really excited to give you your first, you know, your first service here at the store. Please visit us here. How do we get that message out? Whether it's the least. Okay, so here, here's my question, because, you know, 75 percent of the dealers in the country sell under 100 cars a month. OK, so the majority of the dealers are not the big players that we see out there and the one, the Brian Ben stocks and some of the you know big monster players. Sure. So when you think about a service BDC, that is and, and I do think you have to separate your service and your sales BDC because it really is two different talk tracks. So from an expense standpoint, help the 75 percent of the dealers out there that are selling less than 100 cars a month. Are they better to adopt a technology, machine learning, whatever you want to call it? I'm not as technology, I'm not as smart as you are, but but I understand the bottom line. Or put in that BDC because that's expensive. Hiring people is expensive. And so it sounds to me like that can be outsourced through machine learning, through technology, through artificial intelligence, whatever. God, I really sounded smart saying that, didn't I? Mm -hmm. um, but but it's yeah, but it, but it, it does seem like it would be less expensive than hiring bodies. Am I right or wrong? I, I think you're absolutely right. If you get the if you get the buy-in or you have a plan that can still execute, you know, based on your overall strategy. I don't I think putting any tool or anything in place that isn't going to have the adoption rate or the user interface or the vendor managing at the level of expectation that was promised, uh, and there's a lot of ways that we could still fail in this. I think if you're a business owner, if you're a dealer dealer principal, fixed ops director, you have to make the decision of, can I put this tool in place? 
Can it achieve my basic needs for follow-up and communicating with my customer database effectively? Can I do it either with little or little to no interaction from my team? And, and I say that with a caveat and that you will never be successful with any software or any product or any plan if you don't talk to the person providing it to you. Well, um, that and the fact that you that you own the success, right? I mean, you know, people over the years, I, I've seen them put in stuff and they're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And they, you know, and they think if you build it, people will come. Well, somebody has to own it, right? Somebody's got to own the project. Somebody's got to own uh, the responsibility of it being successful. Somebody's got to manage it. And I think that's where so many vendors get lost in the fray because they have really great products, really great products. But nobody at the dealership level wants to own it. I think you're right. I think if, if we look at those three different types of BDC models of how do we how do we own the communication plan of following up with our customers, the folks that have someone in the store that own it win every single time. Every single time. Every single time. It's just a fact. Yeah. It, the problem, I think, and, and I'm speaking a little freely here, you asked me was for the folks that don't have someone who can own it, for someone who doesn't have a, a two person, five person, 10 person service BDC, who isn't outsourcing it to a professional BDC. If I'm selling 40, 50 cars a month and another 40, 50 used and business is good, but I know that retention could be better, or I know that I could do more in CPRO money, you have to put in a plan that allows you as either an owner, leader, or management team to, to spend 30 minutes a week, 30 minutes a week with whatever tool, vendor, person that is going to own that process for you and say, here's what I see, here's what I feel, and here's what I expect. And anybody on the other end of that phone, whether it's a vendor or a BDC manager, or whoever it should be is, okay, here's my expectation. Here's the plan that I have to do to put it in place. And then now do I have a tool to, put, to help me make that easier? Maybe that's through my CRM or through a, an equity mining tool or whatever that may be. It can't be a Google sheet. It can't be an OEM manufactured list. It can't be some, here's a giant bucket, go work this. There needs to be some sort of level of strategy involved in it. So that way you have a real plan of data, advertising, follow-up, pre and post service appointment. And then can, and that continues to feed your machine. So that way re, new, new ROs are feeding old ROs and vice versa as they continue to come back into our, into our service marketing funnel. Yeah, because I'm going to make a prediction. And I don't know that it's going to be a popular prediction, but I'm going to make it, is that 2021 is going to be a little bit tougher Imagine that, that uh, because of the squeezed inventories and the pressures on inventory, mm -hmm. uh, potentially seeing some higher interest rates, some movement there. And so all of that being said, I think that there's going to be some challenges coming into 2021 for automotive dealers. And I think service is, you know, that fixed ops, you know, that fixed absorption, the magic word, fixed absorption, right? And so he or she that can win the game on getting as close to 100% fixed absorption as they can get, then, you know, the sales will be just as they fall, right? You know, so if you're with a brand that's got, you know, that that is 50% behind on production for uh, Q1 and Q2, you know, you're not going to just lose the house, right? right? And so by, so putting that hyper focus on your service department, on your fixed operations and getting into the game, retaining those important clients and more importantly, grabbing them from your competitors, right? I think that's that's the one thing that I'm a big focus. I think you're right. I think 2021 is could be challenging. Maybe not. We'll see how things shake up between now and then. I mean, I'm hoping not. I'm not. I know, right? I'm I'm not. My, my goal for, for dealers as, as we wrap up here is, is understand that to do good business, you have to work on good business. And then if we're not going to bring them in on a sales incentive, we're not going to, you know, we can't bring them on a cheapest sales incentive and then expect them to stay and do service with us over and over and over if we're not talking to them and if we're not exactly. communicating with them. So follow up early, follow up often, before appointments, after appointments, find one of those methods that can that you can plug into your place to fill those cracks in your business. And I think you'll find 2021 increased ROs, increased CPROs, and, uh, and hopefully we keep the house afloat while we figure out what's going on with the front end. Yeah, the fortunes in the follow-up, my friend. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. A hey, great, great information, Aaron. Thank you so much. Lisa, what a wonderful interviewer you are. Wow. And, you know, coming from the retail automotive industry, you know, Lisa understands this so, so well. And fixed ops right now is, you know, been keeping things going. And I, I agree with what you said, that uh, it may be a tad tougher. Uh, but, you know, with with Aaron and auto, the auto miner and the tools that uh, his company offers that can really help dealers uh, not just survive, but thrive, you know, in these times. So in this in this season, Aaron Sheeks, 
from the auto miner and Lisa Copeland. Thank you so much. Uh, how do we uh, go ahead and reach uh, both of you? Oh, Gina, see you got some contact information on the screen. Contact Aaron at Aaron at the auto and uh, Lisa Copeland on Instagram. Is that right? Mm -hmm. At real, uh, real Lisa Copeland. So thank you so much. Great job, everybody. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the show. Well, Ted, I'm hearing the sound of drums, and that just means one thing. It's time to get Aaron and Lisa back to reality. All they have to say is... Jumanji! What a journey we've been on so far. Or should I say, so far -y. But our next guests are here to tell us how to get customers on the tour bus and keep them coming back for more. Katie Mares and Corey Perlman, I hear the drums and they're calling for you. Katie, Corey. We're so glad you made it to the Fixed Ops Roundtable, Jumanji. Welcome. Thank you so much. You're so excited to be here. And I'm so excited to not be by myself and to have Corey with me. So, I mean, the big welcome is really to go to Corey. Thanks for joining <laughs> us, Corey. <laughs> My pleasure. I'm glad we made it, Katie. Good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, it, looked like it was rough coming in, but we're glad you guys are here. Now. We're here. We're here. That's crazy. Uh, Katie Maris is the we Chief are, Operating Officer of Permashield and uh, a great friend of the Fixed Ops Roundtable. You'll recognize Katie. She has spoken at multiple Fixed Ops Roundtables and is the recipient of the yeah. coveted Best Practice Award uh, for her presentation that we did just about a year ago, Katie, back in New Jersey. I when we know. had the, the physical events, yeah. That's and we want to welcome for the first time uh, Corey Perlman. Uh, Corey from Impact Social Media here to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Corey, very honored to have you as well. Thank you, Ted. Thanks for having me, man. All right. Uh, so, Katie, I'm excited about uh, your topic this time and uh, excited to hear how you and Corey will interact. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn the show over to you. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Ted, so much. And again, I'm so excited to be on with you, Corey. This is the second time that we get to do this. And the information that we have, I feel like everybody needs to hear. So, um, yeah, welcome to your first uh, Fixed Ops Roundtable. And um, I'm going to let you sort of tell the audience a little bit about you and what you do and how we connect, and and then we can get to it. Sounds great, Katie. And and yes, folks, just so you know, if, if you enjoy the presentation, it was all thanks to Katie for getting us here together. <laughs> if you didn't like it, come see me. I, it's probably my fault. But, uh, but thank you so much for having both of us. Um, yeah, so I've been in the digital marketing space for, for 12 plus years, I actually started my career with General Motors at the e-commerce division there and taught car dealers about internet marketing back in the, the early 2000s. And so um, I kind of feel like I'm back home, which you know gets me super excited that you invited me here, Katie. So thank you so much. And yeah, today what we're, we're looking to do is, is take you on a journey. Uh, kind of similar to what we did here with Jumanji, uh, but a sales journey all the way from mm -hmm. prospecting and getting people um, interested uh, to uh, generating credibility. So once they have found you, what's their experience like uh, online when they're kicking your tires, so to speak? Mm -hmm. What are they seeing? And are you increasing your credibility or diminishing it? And then staying top of mind. How are you staying top of mind with people from research mode all the way to buy mode? And then there's building rapport. Uh, once they become customers, and this is where I transition to Katie quite a bit and why we work so well together, is I often focus on the prospect. So when Katie comes in, she's talking about you know her, her dig, our, your digital story and making sure that the customer has a five-star experience. So, And then the last one is earning referrals, which is my favorite part of all of social media, Katie, and we talk about this together so much, is creating uh, a sales force out of our customers and making them advocates of our brand. So that's where we're going, and I'm super excited to be. Are you ready to, to jump in, Katie, and rock and roll? As always, especially with this topic. So are you going to pull us in with the, because you're the first touch point. You yeah. help dealers get those folks into the funnel. So let's start with you, Corey. Okay, so we'll jump into the, the first part, which is prospecting. And again, we have a, you know kind of a short amount of time, so we're going to give you the nitty gritty. And the question I'm always asked around prospecting is, should you have a digital budget 
uh, for social? And you and I both agree 100% that the answer is yes. So I'll give a few things around best practices around uh, an advertising budget. And then please chime in, Katie, with some of your thoughts, because I remember last time they were super, super valuable. So uh, the, again, a question I get a lot is what amount? And I don't know the size of your dealership or whatever the case may be, but it typically for a small to medium sized business can be a couple hundred dollars up to about $1,000 a month to get started and really gain some traction mm -hmm. with social advertising. And the two places that I like to use them most, uh, one is called a lookalike audience. And I just want you all to write down lookalike audience. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is you may have a current database, whether it be email marketing or website visitors, Facebook and Instagram can literally create an audience of similar or like demographics. So they can advertise you to an audience of similar demographics, which I find super powerful. And the second area that I like um, so much, Katie, is remarketing. And I think this is very powerful in the auto industry. Somebody goes, they check you out on your site, whatever the case may be, but they don't buy. They go back to their social media and you can stay with them, right? Just like mm -hmm. the spatula stays with you on Amazon. I love that analogy. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> spatula. So those are my two favorite, remarketing and uh, lookalike audience. Katie, what are, what's your perspective on digital advertising? Well, here it is. I love the, the lookalike audience. I think it's super important because Facebook, that's where Facebook really gets to work its magic, which is amazing. But the, the kicker is you actually need an audience to make a lookalike audience. Mm -hmm. And so what you do, the service you provide, the experience you provide to the people who walk into your dealership and then get them to follow you and your social media journey is super important because if you don't have those people following you and um, creating an audience, creating that following, then Facebook can't do its job. You're kind of shooting in the dark. So it's really important that when you do have folks come through the door that you're engaging with them and creating an experience that makes them go, hmm, I want to follow them some more so that that way you can have success in actually creating that lookalike audience. I really, really love the spatula analogy as well. And the reason why I love this is because within dealerships, I think the one customer experience touch point that we fail at most frequently is the in-between visit interaction. And what I mean about that uh, with that is that we fail to reach out and catch up and connect to these customers that leave our dealership and not buy. What social media allows you to do and what Corey is talking about is making sure that they actually get to follow you or you, you follow them, sorry, excuse me, but you follow them on their journey digitally. And it really helps that personalized experience and that in-between visit interaction that we fail at maybe if from a human perspective, we can heavily rely on social media and the digital platforms to do it, not for you, but to assist you in doing it. So I think it's really, really important that you, you write down those two tips because they can really help you engage with your audience as long as you're providing experience that you actually get to create an audience for. You know, and I, I I completely agree with you, Katie, and it's that whole adage, I say this all the time, but none of these uh, principles are new. They're just done mm -hmm. in a different way. And you just brought up the perfect example back in the day, and whether that be the 90s or 80s or 70s for some of us, um, that's multiple touches to a sale. And mm -hmm. oftentimes they say like you need seven, you know, marketing touches of some kind and, you know, to the sale. And, and to your point, digital advertising could fit right into that. The second layer is uh, the two layers that I'll mention real quickly here are building credibility and staying top of mind. <laughs> and so this is sort of after you've gotten that initial exposure. And this is where I often see businesses fail is once they've found you out, they've looked on Google, they've, you know, they've stumbled upon your dealership, whatever the mm -hmm. case may be, or they're online, they're checking you out, they're kicking your tires, they're looking at your website. So a couple of quick things on your website, it's gotta be mobile responsive. I advise yeah. everybody watching this to go to your website with your phone <laughs> and do the thumb test. Hold your four fingers on your phone, your phone and navigate your website just with your thumb. Not just the homepage, but the whole entire site. And if it's a struggle mm -hmm. for you, I promise you, it's a struggle for the rest of your visitors. So make sure you fix it and have a flawless mobile experience because more than 50% of people are navigating your dealership websites or any website 
via your phone. The other area that I'll tell you that you really got to focus on are those online directories. Uh, making sure that when I go check you out on Yelp, Google My Business, whatever those directories are showing up on Google, that I see way more positive reviews than negative ones. Remember this, people are more motivated when they're unhappy than when they're happy. You don't have to mm -hmm. motivate somebody to write a review. They had a bad experience, but you know this, Katie, in your line of work, mm -hmm. when they're happy, we've got to give them a process to go and, and write a positive review. What are your feelings yeah. on that? So I agree. I actually think we should take the onus off the customer and not give them more work uh, to be done. So from a flawless and seamless customer experience and creating that ease of interaction and that five star experience, anytime we have the ability to not make the customer work, we should take it. And I think online reviews are one of those things because while some may want to just get on and do it themselves, you can also ask permission to take their verbal review that they've just given you and say, hey, can I post that on your behalf and tag you? Um, and that really helps alleviate the customer because I mean, let's face it, our wheels are turning, uh, our lives are busy, and the moment they leave you, they're thinking about something else. So it is gonna take follow-up in itself to get that review online. If you could take care of it in that moment, you're helping yourself and you're helping the customer. 100%. Uh, take the, 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 the grunt work or the heavy lifting off of mm -hmm. your customer. Because they get busy. And timing is everything, Katie. So uh, that, that first ride, I always tell my friends in the oh, auto, yeah. first ride, man, that's when you want to hit them with that testimonial. So, so far we've talked about prospecting. We've talked about a little bit about um, building credibility. And I want to talk about staying top of mind. So this is, again, goes back kind of that seven touches standpoint, but oftentimes mm -hmm. we'll re interact with a customer and they'll be in research mode. So the question is, how do we stay uh, top of mind with content? So I'm going to bring this up, but you really drive this point home like you did last time talking about their story and being really personal, uh -huh. but it's really about content. And the one best practice that I'll give you all here today to take with you is to have a content calendar days of the week dedicated to categories of content. It's so helpful to you as the potential business owner, as well as everyone that works at your dealership or your business. Everybody knows that Tuesday is Testimonial Tuesday. So every Tuesday a testimonial goes out. Mm -hmm. So if Steve is out on the floor, and just like you said, somebody's like, oh my gosh, I had the greatest experience with you guys, thank you so much. Steve can mm -hmm. say, hey, I got myself a testimonial Tuesday to send uh, to Marcy who, who works on the digital marketing. So having that calendar keeps everybody organized and consistent. I totally agree. Um, I mean, everything from everything you do to create a process and actually action a process takes planning and it takes a blueprint. And it's not different with social media and digital marketing and the experience that you get, um, that you, you give, sorry, it within the dealership. You need brand standards and you need your brand standards to be reflected in your digital content calendar. Um, I love, love, love that tip. It is something mm -hmm. that um, I personally use for Permashield. We, we use, I have a huge content calendar that we plan out every single uh, top of the month, but every day is a certain thing. Um, and I manage eight different profiles, right? So we have eight different profiles, but we've got the days of the weeks. And within those profiles, have we have the same type of experience but depending on the customer we're speaking to and so i think i'd love to throw that back at you corey is how important is it to know your customer when you create that online experience because from a in-person experience really understanding who they are um, collecting the golden nuggets as to what they need and want and in the experience and then anticipating their needs and delivering a plus one experience is super important to create that warm and fuzzy feeling and an experience customers can't live without. How important is it to understand who you're targeting in the digital space? Ah, great, great question. Absolutely critical. Um, I think, you know, knowing your demographic also um, dictates where you plant your social media flag. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes I'm asked about Snapchat and TikTok. I can't tell you how many times I'm asked about that, Katie. And yeah. my, answer, <laughs> my answer is always the same. It depends on your audience. <laughs> 
if your audience is 13 to 26, then yeah, you got to be all on it. But if, if they're, you know, above that, which I think your audience is, then you're looking at more Instagram with the millennial market. And then Facebook still is the behemoth in the industry, um, over a billion users. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, it trends a little bit older. And then to your point, knowing the more nuances about your customer base, what their interests are, um, you know, male, female, obviously mm -hmm. is important, uh, geographical yeah. location, you know, and social media gives you that power. And you, you asked, you asked the question at a perfect time because it moves us to building rapport. And this is where your sweet spot is. Um, once they become a customer, mm -hmm. it's so easy. And I, I, again, I liken these to these old sales adage tips, but I read a book when I was much younger called how to swim with the Cirques without being eaten alive by Harvey McKay. And in there as a salesperson, he tells you to know 60 some odd things about your customers. And today, Katie, on social media, he never knew this when he wrote this book, how easy it it's is to find there. out these things. It's all yeah. there, right? See, so talk about that. Talk about the customer well, experience with that. Well, who's our favorite person to talk about, to write about, to, 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 I mean, it's us, it's ourselves. We, I mean, every single post is about what we're doing and how fabulous our life is. And um, you know, what's going on in our life, even if it's not fabulous, we are willing to put all that information out there. It's just whether or not your eyes are open to actually seeing it, collecting it, and then the kicker is using it, using it to actually tailor the experience so you can have that spatula that follows somebody around as well as a personalized experience that goes from your digital experience and that brand experience and you put that through and it's reflected in your four walls when your customer walks in the door. Amen. And I want to kind of end the, the five areas. So we talked about prospecting, building credibility, staying top of mind, building mm -hmm. rapport. And this last one, again, I feel like it's completely in your sweet spot, which is um, earning referrals and creating that customer experience that they want to share online. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, here it is. I I swear I say I'm going to write myself out of a job every time I say this, but it's truly about being a nice and genuine person. So if you use their name and you show compassion and you actually genuinely care about the person in front of you, they're going to open up to you and they're going to give you all the golden nuggets you need in order to tailor their experience and anticipate their needs. If you do that, that's going to lead to referrals and that's going to lead to your audience that, you know, Corey first talked about that, that audience that's going to create your lookalike audience, which is only going to help your digital brand experience explode. It's awesome. You nailed it right on the head. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll turn it over to the guys is never let a verbal testimonial go unpublished. What I simply mean by that is when somebody says something in your dealership, face-to-face -face, text, email, make yep. sure it gets to social to make your jobs so much easier. Corey, so For important sure. to do that. Yeah. And to have a process like you've been saying to do that as well and to, and to be seeking those out as well. So Amen. great job. Corey Perlman and Katie Mayers here today at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Well, you know, I'm hearing the drums beat now, Ted, and that just means one thing. We have to get Corey and Katie oh. back to the real world. The only way to do that is for them to both say, <laughs> Jumanji! <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I'm so glad to be here in the jungle preparing for my next big role in life. The governor of Texas. I'm great when it comes to rustling longhorns and dealing with ghosts of the past girlfriends. When it comes to politics, there's some real wild beasts I'll have to tackle. When I take that podium out of the rally, I'll have to lay that heart on the line. If I do that, I cannot lose. All right, all right, all right. What if you could make a phone call and collect $100,000 to $150,000 a year by obtaining retail rates on both warranty parts and labor? Sound too good to be true? We do all of the work for your dealership. We are the pioneers in retail reimbursement and regarded as the industry leader amongst dealers, accountants, and state dealer associations nationwide. And we don't share in your new profits. You keep it all. 
Your service managers and parts managers are busy. They have a job to do. Leave it up to the experts. We offer a turnkey solution. Your manufacturer won't know you retained a law firm. Our firm has made thousands of submissions and has collected hundreds of millions of dollars for our clients in over 45 states. Because of our unmatched experience, our results yield the highest possible increases. We offer a low flat fee, never a contingency fee. Our fees are much lower than non-attorney consultants who take a percentage of your added profits. We are lawyers. This is legal work. Your state statute controls the outcome. The factories rely on their lawyers to respond. So let us level the playing field. Bottom line, thousands of dealers have selected Belavia Blatt for their retail warranty submissions. With our low flat fee, expert reputation, and behind the scenes work model, we are your best choice. Do you have a great product you want to get in front of auto dealers across the country, and specifically their fixed ops departments? You know their service, parts, and body shop? For over 15 years, Fixed Ops Magazine has been putting service-related products like yours in front of franchise auto dealers across the country. There simply is no better way to reach every dealer in the USA all at once. Hi, I'm Ron, the publisher of Fixed Ops Magazine, which is both a digital at fixedopsmag.com and print magazine that reaches out to over 38,000 subscribers who influence what products are purchased in the over 16,000 dealers across the country. Fixed Ops Magazine may even publish your article about a topic you are an expert and have a real passion for in this industry. Every article has the author's contact info so they can reach you. Write an article, run an ad, and an e-blast. We call that our bundle for success. You won't believe how great a deal it is. So to get started, call, text, or email me and I'll tell you more. We are 100% devoted to the franchise stores so we don't waste your time or money. We are laser focused on your prospects. Fixed Ops Magazine, the number one way to get your product in front of auto dealers today. www.fixedopsmag.com Ron at FixedOpsMag.com, 714-803-5476. Fixed Ops Magazine, the number one way to get your product in front of auto dealers today. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable, Jumanji. Sometimes I get in a rut. There are lots of ruts in the jungle. I stop looking for all the benefits the jungle offers. Any new ideas? Ha, forget about it. But maybe I can get some help from the Safari panel loaded with innovators and overlooked profit seekers. Sponsored by Dan Drews and ARD. Well, welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. And we're really excited about this panel that's coming up. And uh, we want to welcome Dan Drews from Auto Remote Direct. Uh, this is going to be the innovative and overlooked profit panel. And uh, Dan, we're excited to have you back. And we're equally excited to have the moderator of this panel, which is Ed, none other than Ed Roberts, the Fixed Ops Director at Bozard Ford Lincoln, St. Augustine, Florida. So Ed, I'm going to go ahead and turn the show over to you. Thank you, Ted. I also want to thank Gene and uh, welcome everyone. The uh, as, as Ted mentioned there, this is uh, some profit that we've overlooked for quite some time. And uh, when I was talking to, to Dan, he kind of told me that uh, he has some opportunities. This goes back a little over a year ago and uh, the uh, he was he was spot on. But let me introduce my panel that I have here today and uh, hopefully we can help you guys with uh, finding some uh, some newfound profit. Got Dan Drews with ARD. I have, and hopefully I can get the name right here. I have Gary Rosen Treader with Ziegler Automotive Group. And then I think everybody knows the familiar face of Mike Vogel, the fixed ops coach. The, uh, so Dan, if I can get you to, uh, to come on board there, the uh, couple things that I wanted to talk to you about is, is some opportunities. Um, how, does, how does ARD bring opportunity to the dealership uh, when it comes to preventing from outsourcing keys and that type of thing? Thanks, Ed. Thanks for having us, guys. So we, we like to think of ourselves as the, uh, the the one-stop key fob shop, and you know the total solution for for dealerships. 
uh, in their uh, key fob blues per, per, per se. And uh, we're, we're able to uh, get anybody going with their, uh, their in-house key fobs. And you guys are going to be able to cut and program keys, fobs, and smart keys for 95% of the, the vehicles on the road. Um, we've got you know, a few different levels of uh, OEM keys, refurbished keys, and our ARD house brand that, that, are, that all carry the same manufacturers, guarantees, and warranties that you guys get from the factories. Uh, all on our dynamic website with, with over 6,000 SKUs. Uh, and, and not to forget our, our two mobile apps that we, that we do offer, one for training and one for ordering and, and operating on a, on a daily basis. You said you got a house brand. Does a house brand look um, like the factory one? Yes, sir. So it's, it is a OEM lookalike and programs just, just the same as, as an OEM remote. Uh, and also, if it, if it is your brand, if, if need be, you can use your own uh, OEM tools to to program them. Do you have tools to program the uh, the non branded stuff that a, a dealer may be programming? Yes, sir. That's that's kind of what got us uh, into the dealership realm. We, we saw that need for first of all training because there was little to no training. Gary and I can can attest to that uh, together uh, on that one, and just the, the pricing. So we we offer both tools, uh, the Smartbox automotive programmer which programs 95 percent of the vehicles on the road and the uh, condo mini plus so together they are the uh they're the most capable tool out there they're the least expensive but more importantly it's the easiest to use and the easiest to train on uh, so you're able to duplicate keys uh, as well as uh, cut by code at so we can cut as well as, as well as program with them for sure for sure 95 percent of the vehicles on the road perfect the uh I'm going to shift gears here for a minute and uh, and, and ask Mike a couple questions. Um, Mike, you're, you've kind of been known for quite some time as being the coach and kind of guide people through help keeping expenses in check and and, and, and raising the value of uh, perceived value from a customer standpoint. Um, but tell us, why is it important to uh, keep customers in-house and rather than send them down to uh, have a key cut somewhere or have them come back when the key guy's here? Um, tell us about uh, keeping them in house. Thanks, Ed. Um, well, my my key items, as most of you that have watched previous roundtables and and other discussions, I'm all about trust, value, and convenience. So I think you know at, from the dealership level, if you're selling a car, whether it's a new car or a used car, and you need an extra set of keys or an extra remote, if the customer is going to be inconvenienced by having to come back for that. Uh, or the car being sold with not enough keys, not enough remotes. That, that's a negative in my opinion. Second part of that is um, it's not very convenient if you're going to send them out to a locksmith, whether it's a, a sales customer or a service customer. Um, why would you want to hand off a customer that's already yours to somebody else and trusting them that they're going to make that customer happy? Um, and the flip side is if they don't make them happy, have you lost that customer now? Kind of look, look at it the same way as tires. Do, do you want to send your customer down to Firestone or Goodyear or Pep Boys, any of those places for tires? Not in, the, not in this day and age. Um, so it ticks all three boxes, in my opinion. Trust, obviously, we're the dealer. Um, we sold the car. We're the, we represent the manufacturer. We should be the experts on this, and we should be able to do it. Um, value is um, we're not more expensive than going down to the locksmith and having it done. And then convenience is in itself. They're already at your dealership. Why are you going to send them off somewhere else? Exactly. And, and we typically lose keys in-house as well. So sometimes it's not necessarily just what, uh, what we need to replenish from a trade-in or whatever else. We lose keys, uh, whether Absolutely. they didn't bring both keys when they traded it or and they just don't marriage back up again. Um, I think about every dealer out there has a box of keys that didn't get paired back up with the vehicle that was traded in. So it's, it's, it's a huge opportunity to let it, to have that vehicle ready to go with two keys rather than have to bring them back for something that we owe them. Absolutely. It sets a really good perception of the dealership, very professional um, and uh, trusting. And it kind of goes back to what Telly always tells us. What is that, Mike? That is repeat and referral customers. That's what we're all about. If we're not focused on that, we're missing the boat. 
if we don't make it convenient, they're not going to re they're not going to be repeat customers, and they're not going to be referring people to us. And, and it goes with the other things as well. If we're not building value or trust, both of those things tie in as well. Absolutely. I'm going to shift gears to Gary for a minute. And Gary, I got to ask, did I get your last name right? It was, it was close. Rosen 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 Rosen. All right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yes. That's a long one. Um, when, when, when Dan and I was talking, he told me that uh, you're a customer of his as well. Uh, it's, it's kind of a two part question. Um, I'm going to start off uh, the long story. Uh, about two years ago, we needed a key machine. And Dan can tell you the horror stories about the, you know, the dinosaur in the back room that takes 10 minutes to cut one key. So along came Dan, you know, and uh, hooked us up with this brand new, nice Condor Mini. And, um, you know, that, like I said, about two years ago. And the bonus smart box, which I didn't really know what was going on at the time. And then, uh, you know, I'm going to go to the second part, the, the success of using the, the system. Um, probably about maybe a couple months ago, finally really started rolling out um, a successful process using uh, the key cutting and uh, programmer. So it sounds like you guys have been using it twice as long as we have. We've been on it for a little over a year. Um, I've had the programmer, I guess, for, I don't know, four or five months now that we've moved to our mobile trucks, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But uh, the uh, huge opportunity to, to keep the key vendors at other dealers' lots rather than ours. Um, what kind of success stories do you have since you've been on this program? Oh, well, um, our company does a, a similar panel uh, a couple times a year. Uh, for the general managers and you know all the rooftops we get on a zoom meeting um, and one of the um, uh, things that uh, the parts managers are requested to do is bring an idea that all the dealerships could incorporate um, uh, specifically parts department so I, I presented the idea of cutting and programming second keys for all makes and models and uh, literally my fixed ops director looked at me and said that is amazing amazing idea why aren't we doing this already you know and how come our other dealerships aren't doing it so uh with having the best idea of course <laughs> thanks to dan um uh, i got awarded 100 bucks there you go and and a little bit of recognition yeah yeah yes who are you cutting cut keys for primarily uh primarily our process is uh geared towards our used car non-branded uh vehicles so uh car comes in if it doesn't have a second key, it's getting one. When you say non-branded, what what uh, what brands do you guys? What, what's your primary brand? What's primary your brand? brands Infinity, Infinity. So yeah, basically we don't want to take away from our service department with this process because uh, with uh, the process we developed with the the Condor and the Smart Box, it's staying in the parts department. Do you find that this covers most makes and models that you guys run through the used car department? Absolutely. Yeah, I go through, I hunt the, we use a multi-point inspection auto point system. I hunt through to see all the used cars and then I'll, I'll check the ARD website and see which ones I can cut and program. And then I shoot over the quote. Who cuts and program, who cuts and programs them for you in the house? As of right now, our process is it stays in the parts department. Um, when it gets a little too overwhelming, which it's getting there because the, the demand is there, uh, then we can kind of put it out to maybe get a, a one of the hourly tax or uh, even a porter. I mean, as Dan was saying, uh, so little training, so easy. The uh, We have a large fleet department. Most of those um, municipalities likes to have multiple keys, not just the two that the vehicle come with. So we'll, we'll send vehicles out of here, brand new vehicles out of here with five keys because that's what they're requesting. So it makes it much easier and, and keeps the cost in control there with doing that. fish market you'll see lots of flying fish but we saw more great customer service teamwork energy and results so how can you bring this kind of energy to your organization the answers are in fish the most watched training video in the world the fish philosophy is a fresh powerful training solution it has four easy-to-use practices. They help you create an environment where people love to come to work. One fish flying to Deborah. One fish flying to Deborah. 
And so fish really lights people's hearts on fire. It helps them understand, hey, it's, it's up to me. And then it shows them a very simple, predictable pathway. So we all need ways to get pumped up and get re-motivated and refocused on what it means to really work together. Checking bags. Checking bags. How you doing, sir? You? Nearly every industry uses the fish philosophy to deliver amazing customer service. How's it going? Improve teamwork and trust. The more we incorporate the fish philosophy in what we do, the better job we do and the better our patients do. It is absolutely transform the climate of our school. Our discipline problems have gone down dramatically. Businesses that I see use fish invariably end up the first choice, not just for the customers that they serve, but for people who want to work there. You build great environments where people want to come to work and where people say, that's the business that I want to do business with. Contact us to learn how the fish philosophy will help you. We're, we're always looking to control expense, um, but not only, Mike, maybe this is for you. This isn't just control and expense, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to generate some growth in addition to it. So it's an opportunity to control cost and generate some some gross, it's not too many times that we get those kind of opportunities, is it? No, and, and, and I think, you know, you, you need to look at um, keys and remotes in the same boat as tires, as, as in the same boat as accessories. Okay, they're not gonna be high gross items. However, some gross is better than no gross at the end of the month. The other thing to consider is, um, you know, going back early in my career, we didn't have anything, any companies like ARD around that we had the opportunity to cut keys uh, for every make and model and remotes. And so subsequently, we sublet a lot of work to outside uh, locksmiths. So what you're doing is you're taking the owner's money, basically sending it outside, spending it with an outside vendor, which, which sometimes is necessary, but if you can avoid it, why wouldn't you? And um, so at, at the end of the day, um, you're tra if you keep it in-house, you're transferring the money from one pocket to, the, to another. And I don't know any dealer principal or general, man general manager that would not be <laughs> extremely excited about that as opposed to cutting a check every month. So um, don't, go, don't approach this as, you know, charging your door rate for cutting keys and programming remotes and, and things of that nature. Look at it as an opportunity to bring a little bit of gross in or, or even a, a decent amount of gross. Maybe not what, what you're used to in gross percentages, but uh, again, you know, using accessories, for example, I worked for a dealership years ago where the owner just said, look, this is gonna be the labor rate for accessories and this is what parts gross is gonna be on the uh, accessory parts. And we killed it. He would give us literally 25, 30 cars at a time, accessorize the hell out of them. And we, we were hugely successful. Customers loved it because the, the accessory was priced right. And we made gross that we probably would have never had because we were priced too high. So yeah, that, that's, that's the way you need to look at it. Trust, value, convenience, price it accordingly. Don't price yourself out of the market. If you price it right and you keep it convenient, it builds trust. The, uh, uh, Gary, you said that you guys are, are doing it mostly in, in parts where you're cutting the key. Who's programming them? Are you, is parts programming them as well or is tech programming them? That's right, yeah. Myself and uh, one of my countermen is trained. So, I mean, it's, it's so easy. It doesn't take us much time. I mean, yeah, we do need coverage in the parts department, so we'll you know, pretty much work like a mini service department in that, that aspect and put some time aside to get it done. So if parts is programmed on that, gives additional opportunity to expand that, that margin that you make on the parts side of that because you're not yeah. having to pay out in labor. Not just that. I mean, we once we touch the car, you know, then we can kind of look in, hey, it doesn't have wheel locks. Let's put wheel locks on it. Let's, you know, then we can accessorize it. You know, it's it's a great opportunity just to put the hands on and see what else we can uh, we can do to you know, raise the value of the vehicle. Having some opportunity to talk about it and find those points, especially the customer standing there, yeah. an opportunity to build some value there as well. 
Absolutely. We incorporated it in on our mobile trucks, and it's allowed us to, to pick up another element of roadside service. I'm not in I'm not in the mobile service business to be on roadside, but it is tough to send to call roadside for anybody, whether it's for a flat tire, out of gas, keys locked out, and we can add those elements to it. That just enhances what we do. Um, but not only that, if I don't have that key blank in the house when I sell a used vehicle and they need a third key or, or whatever the situation may be, I can order it from Dan. And, and when I get it in, I can send my mobile truck out to them, whether it's their place of business or their home, um, program that key on site. And we don't, we never create the inconvenience factor for the customer and we're fulfilling what we told them that we were going to give them to begin with. So build on that trust as well and then making it convenient for them. Dan, I'm going to circle back to you here. Yes, sir. And then we can kind of have some conversation and, and, and go from there. But it yeah. sounds like you're making an impact on the industry. We, we like to think we are. Uh, it, it, it certainly sounds like you are. You, you have with us. Sounds like you have with Gary. Uh, Mike's buying right into it. Tell us about if somebody wanted to to sign up and, and, and get the ball rolling. What do you do for training? Um, we got, I, I still do it with my technicians. Gary's doing it with his counter guys, which I think is brilliant because it gives a little more gross opportunity there. Um, tell us what you do for training, ongoing support. Uh, and you talked about all three of your keys carry the same kind of warranty. I don't know if throwing three things at you at once, but kind of tell us about that a little bit. Sure. Well, the most the most important part of this is the training. And, uh, you know, starting in parts when I was much younger, that was like when the Volkswagen laser, the laser cut stuff came out and everybody kind of freaked out. And Gary remembers this. It was an absolute nightmare. Um, so, and especially when I went to onboard him with our, with our tools, you guys have heard this story of me talking about this cracking in the back room. That was Gary's machine. It looked like something out of Empire Strikes Back. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. Nobody knew how to use it. It was just a nightmare. Um, so we think that's very important you know, that they know how to use the key. And and they're not afraid to use the, the key cutting machine like, like it has in the past. And it's not, you know, an arm and a leg uh against uh, your dealership every month to pay for this thing. No, never ending leases. Um, training, you know, in, in the Chicagoland, obviously we've, we've gone out and we've, we've trained them in person like I, like I had with Gary uh, a couple times. And what, what we've done now is we've perfected our, uh, our in-house studio training. It's live. It's, it's necessary to, to be able to, you know, scale this across the country uh, to all the dealerships that do want this. So we've, we've kind of perfected it. We've, we've, we've done this with about 300 to 350 dealerships over the, over the last few years. You know, we, we always uh, we always get them on the on the in-house studio training. It's about 45 to 50 minutes long. They can ask questions as we go. So there's a there's a live Q and A, and really the the tools kind of speak for themselves with the with the simplicity. It's I think it's just done by you know year make and model and you know push this button, turn on the emergency lights, and, and really. Within two to three minutes, you're you're done on on most of the vehicles. Um, Ed, to to kind of uh, talk about the, the warranties and guarantees, uh, I it's been brought to me you know several times with the warranties are two years from the manufacturers, and we just go ahead and, and, and put that on all of our products, you know, from the new OE, which which you know a, a lot of Ford and Lincoln dealers are getting from us with our, our distributorships that we have to offer that refurbished OEM carries the same two-year warranty and our, and our house brand. And really we, we've we've only seen maybe 1% in, in RMAs across the board. With our tools, miscuts were always a, a big problem in the in the past. And, and, and Gary, how many how many miscuts have you had with that machine? Not not too many? Uh, zero. zero. I don't think, yeah, I don't think we've had an issue at all, to be honest with you. Zero. Uh, and, and then the upkeep, the maintenance and updates all of our tools come with free updates for life. And, and that's and that's huge because a lot of these companies out there are like, oh, I want two to three thousand dollars a year. Uh, and then go and try to change a, a cutting wheel or a cutting bit on it. Sometimes it's a hundred, sometimes as much as three hundred dollars. And ours are between twenty and twenty-five for that. And they still cut the same amount of keys that the other stuff does. So we've just we've tried to stop that bleeding in, in the uh, in the dealerships and some of the biggest obstacles have been the used car managers. Like, well, my guy's cheaper. Not anymore. You guys won't be charging any more than that van that pulls up, probably purchases it, purchases it from somebody else like us in, in, the, in the long run. And so they're, they're happy. They're not paying any, any more money than they would with from that guy in the truck. 
and they get it that day or, or, or the next. And you guys keep it all in house at, at roughly a, a 50 to 60 percent margin. I won't talk about what those margins are in just a minute, but you talked about the free updates and, and the machine and whatever. It sounds like you're truly in the key business and you you just want you to pick up the accessory to help keep that move and you, you keep that updated with the updated models that comes out and whatever else so that we can continue to sell keys. For, so, for sure. You know, our, our like I said, our, our tools are the least expensive out there, but they are the most capable and easy to use. And that, that was important to be able to arm the dealerships with that kind of program to support it. And yes, you know, so across the, the six thousand plus SKUs that we have, we can we can cover pretty much every make and model. Not Mercedes, not that you ever really want to do that in house because it's very complicated. But the just to plug in the OBD and, and, and follow the steps is is the meat and potatoes of this of this program. So the uh, you talk about training. Well, let's say there's been some turnover. Somebody's left, went to another dealer, whatever else. We bring somebody new in. What do we got to do to get retrained on the? the well, there's, there's one of two things, if not both. We, we, there's always retraining available. So if you do have that turnover, if somebody needs, you know, a refresher, they can always just log on to the training app, pick a pick a day and time they want to jump on, and, and they're more than welcome to do that whenever they want. We also offer one on one with with our tech support once in a while. If somebody just needs a little bit of honing on something, you know, that might be holding them back, we're we're more than happy to do that with our with our tech support team. Which, by the way, is open six days a week, uh, and open till uh, open till the evening. So, if they run into a problem programming a key, can't get over the obstacles, they can call in and somebody can walk them through that. For sure, for sure. So, you, you, with the two-year warranty, talk about and 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 I haven't had an issue with any of your keys. Uh, sounds like Gary hasn't either, but. Things happen. Let's say that there is an issue. How do we file a claim to get that handled with you? So we have an automatic RMA system hooked right into our website. So whatever whatever is easiest for them, if they want to email us or call us and say, hey, could you put through this exchange or return? We're happy to do that. Uh, or they can do it themselves. But every time we, we, we put that through, we, we back up our, our products 100%. We're never going to stick you with something that isn't going to work or isn't, isn't the right key or miscarped. It's not a $100 issue anymore. And as we process that RMA through, you even get a prepaid label, whether it's your fault or not, to send that back to us. And, and nine times out of ten, it's just an exchange. So we're, we're getting out that that correct product or the, or the right or the right product um, then and there. So we had a key vendor that was coming on tight, and I want to talk about that because I mentioned to Mike earlier. It's not very often that you can reduce expense and increase gross with the same transaction. It just doesn't happen very often, and, and this certainly did it for us. And we're not anything different than any other dealer out there, I don't think. Uh, we sell about 600 to 650 new and used cars a, a month. And our average key bill on non-Ford, because we would still take care of all our Fords and all of our Lincolns in-house, our average key bill uh, with our key vendor was eight to 10 grand a month. The used car department today, after bringing ARD in and going full war with them with the programmer and the key cutter and, and having their blanks as well, the used car department spends now between $4,500 and $5,000. So we've cut their expense in half. They still have an expense. They still got to replace those keys, but we've cut that expense in half. And from what I'm charging them in parts and service, that, that $4,500 to $5K, that's $3,000 worth of gross. So it's three grand worth of gross that I didn't have. $5,000 expense reduction to the used car department, mostly to the used car department. There is some new car stuff. We lose keys, sell them, take them home, whatever that situation may be. At the end of the day, you take my gross and put it back in that expense because of the dealer, that's where he looks is where's that in, at the bottom line. We've taken a $10,000 expense and made it somewhere between $1,500 to $2,000. Um, that's huge in, in today's world. And and maybe the, the some of the dealers that's out there listing, they're not selling 600 cars a month. So on 300 cars a month, and their average key cost is five grand, half of that. Um, certainly reducing that by 80% is, is a huge, huge, huge savings. And we're keeping technicians busy. We're keeping the counter guys going. And the easiest way to keep guys happy is to keep them busy and keep them productive, keep them working. The, uh, I'm sure we've created some interest here today, Dan. I think it's a great product. I speak very highly of it because I experience it and we use it every single day. And it enhances our mobile truck. Gary speaks very highly of it. He made some money off of it. Not even he's made some on his paycheck, and he's he's uh, got a little spiff there for best idea. Tell us how we can get a hold of you, or, or how our audience can get a hold of you, 
and and how long it takes to typically get on board with you? So it, you know, it all depends on the on the dealership how fast they want to onboard. Some do it that day, you know, as we, we do. I, I like to do an online consultation with everybody. So I shoot them a quick survey, about five six questions, just to see where they're at right now. Uh, and, and after that, we, we do a quick web demo to make sure they understand all aspects of it. And they, they jump on board usually within a week or two uh, once it's approved at the front office. It's it's pretty fast. You can, you can visit our website at www.autoremotedirect.com or you can reach us at 312-854-1112. We're always there to help. Perfect. I also take keys. We we'll place an order on keys as well. We do. For sure. How long does it take to get them once we place that order? Uh, about about two days, about two business days. Perfect. Well, I think we're running out of time. I see Ted showing back up. Gene, the uh, Gene, it looks like he's stuck out in the jungle there somewhere. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to thank you guys for being a part of the panel today. I think we've brought some valuable information to our dealers and our audience that's listening and watching. The uh, so I appreciate you guys' participation. I want to thank Gary uh, for attending his first fix and speaking at his first Fix Stops Roundtable. Great job today, Gary. So appreciative to have you here. Very honored to have your automotive group here as part of what we're doing today, as well as two best practice winners from the Fix Stops Roundtables. The, the coach, Mike Vogel, uh, who has been the pioneer and helped founding this whole conference. So Michael, thank you so much. Great to see you again. Great to have you here. And Ed Roberts from, from Bozard. So a wonderful job as well. And, and Dan, you know, the technology, it, it's, it keeps getting better and it's more and more relevant than ever before. So, you know, great strides in, in the key industry and in what you're doing, you know, as a profit center for dealers. So congratulations on all the success that Auto Remote Direct ARD is having. Thank you, guys. So, great job, everyone. Thank you. you know, Chad, I'm, I'm hearing the sound of drums and hey, that can only mean one thing. We got to get these guys back out of the virtual world and into the real world. But the only way we can do that is for Ed and Dan to say, Jumanji! From innovative and overlooked to revolutionary, that's what our next guest from Revolution Parts brings to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Andreas, the drums are sounding for you. Welcome to Jumanji. Andreas, you made it to Jumanji. Welcome. Thank God, and thank you for having me. <laughs> Love it. Andreas Ranaseth is the co-founder and chief strategy officer at Revolution Parts. Andreas, welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thank you very much, Ted. Good, uh, happy to be here again. No, honored to have you. And your company has made some amazing strides or has helped, I should say, dealers and OEMs make some amazing strides here this year with all of the innovation and technology that you've put together. I'm really impressed how you've uh, helped dealers basically create their choice of an online store. You put them in business right away or an Amazon store or eBay as well. It looks like it's a, a turnkey that you provide for them. And also you're doing a lot of work on the OEM side as well. So congratulations to you and all the success that Revolution Parts is having. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the name of the game is digital. And, uh, you know, on the parts side of the house, it's it's no different. And, and, and we're getting a lot of energy from both dealers and, and OEMs that just want to understand how they can get in, in the digital game on the, on the parts side. And, and, and we're super excited to, to be there right with them. So kind of take us through that, Andreas. Uh, what have you seen or what has Revolution Parts seen this year in terms of uh, parts uh, in 2020? Yeah, it's, um, you know, not, probably every guest is going to say, well, this year is different, right? Um, I, I think in our case, it was, um, you know, uh, we, we were very optimistic just as we've seen the year develop. Um, uh, you know, generally in the news, you know, people are at home ordering stuff and, then, and it turns out it includes parts. Um, in 2019, uh, Hedges and Company uh, put put out a report where they said there's going to be 16 billion dollars worth of, of parts 
uh, sold in in the U.S. Um, online, right? Okay. And so that that estimate originally before before the pandemic was fourteen point four billion. So so they they revised it upwards because of what was going on, and so that was a one point six billion dollar increase. For Revolution Parts specifically, um, you know, we were able uh, last year in two thousand nineteen to drive around three hundred thirty million. Uh, and, and this year, we're we're set to hit over uh, 400, in, in, uh, in fact, 425 million dollars. That's a 30% increase year over year. You know, wow. what? Which other business can we be in? Channel can we be in right now with a 30% increase? It's it's absolutely incredible, and and that's why we're having a good time. I love it. Now, is there one area in particular that uh, you've seen uh, the most growth? Yeah, you know, um, we've we've really, um, like you mentioned just earlier, we enable dealers to sell both on on, on their own web store or a third party marketplace. Uh, uh, not unlike on you know on new car side where you can put your inventory on various third party marketplaces, right? And so uh, all all of the channels across the board are really a positive story. Um, but on eBay, we've saw we've we've seen some significant uh, growth with with 18% year over year. So the marketplaces have been been uh, strong uh, along with all the other channels. That's amazing. And and your your sites are, are really good looking and intuitive. And I mean, it's, you know, it's a really a no brainer for the dealer to get involved and, and to do this. Um, how are parts performing versus let's say accessories? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's a, a, an interesting, you know, parts, when you think of parts, either you need uh, that water pump or you don't, um, then you have, you know, accessories and performance lines that, that OEMs put out and dealers sell, where it's really more of a want buy, right? Like I would like this, I, 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 you can upsell, you can really drive some additional dollars in those categories. Um, traditionally, Revolution Parts, you know, something like 89% of our sales is mechanical and collision parts. Okay. So really, more those in the in the need category, more than you know the want and kind of upsell category. So that in 2019 left 11 percent for accessories. Um, uh, this year we saw a little bit of uptick in accessories, 13 percent, which is is pretty good. Uh, but I think that's an area, just kind of a prediction for 2021, is we're really going to see some uh, focus there with digital retailing and additional after sales marketing that we can do uh, 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 against accessories specifically and drive up that volume. Uh, a lot of excitement among dealers and OEMs to to focus on that. Uh, and so that's what we're focused on as well. You know, you, we talk about digital retailing and the dealers, you know, even just a few years back, were very resistant to get into the digital, let's say, F&I, okay? And... Um, you know, let alone let alone parts to be doing this, right? So I think what's happened this year has really taken us maybe things that w wouldn't have happened for maybe five, six, seven years. And it's all happened now in these last couple of months. And they're embracing the digital platforms. And now parts is like a, a whole new frontier for uh, dealers and for OEMs to be able to do it this way. I, I I know you don't have a crystal ball, but if you if you looked into the jungle crystal ball, what do you what do you predict uh, in part sales for twenty twenty one? No, that's right, and I think um, a great question. In in you know digital retailing means a lot, right? But I think this overall idea of omnichannel, right? Some stuff online, some research online, you know, some things in store, right? And, and really just meeting people where they are. Uh, no different for part, right? You you have some people that are gonna uh, swear by by coming into the store, right? But others have just gotten used to. I go online, I I click and I buy, and it gets delivered on my door. I, I, you know that is sort of the new standard, um, and so I think you know we're gonna continue to see uh, that expectation being placed on the industry, right? Um, uh, so, so that just, just the online channel of sourcing OE parts, that's going to continue. Uh, I think we're going to see at least a 15% increase year over year mm -hmm. of online part selling, just as that continues to, to go, even after this big jump, um, you know, things are moving online and the auto parts category specifically online, you know, has lagged a bit in terms of adoption compared to, let's say electronics or something like that, that, you know, people are very comfortable buying on, online. So I think dealers and OEMs need to be aware of that digital influence, right? And and find a way to 
to take advantage of that growth, right? It's it's really about meeting the consumers where they are. Um, you know, we see a lot of um, uh, consumers, they do a lot of their research online, right? And, and OEMs and dealers combined have extremely strong brands that they can leverage and build trust with that, with consumers in that, that research phase to really turn them into paying customers, right? Versus letting them go somewhere else. So I think that's going to continue to grow. And, um, you know, we see, we see players in the market, you know, make moves in that direction. Um, and, and we, we are certainly part of that. You're a big part of that. Revolution Parts is the, uh, is the perfect partner and the leader in this space. And um, it's, it's a very easy solution uh, for dealers and OEMs. So um, is there a particular channel that dealers should be focusing on, Andreas? Yeah, I don't know if there's any uh, one particular single channel, right? There's a lot of space to, to be innovative. Uh, we see a lot of dealers, you know, initially, uh, they kind of get us set up with a web store uh, with us. And then once they're comfortable with that and kind of, you know, just talking and selling to that online customer, they move move maybe to the marketplaces or other uh, sides. I think, you know, one of the things that, I, that I'm excited about uh, seeing more next year is really um, innovation on the wholesale side and, and seeing how those systems integrate and how procurement and purchasing of parts happen more on the B2B side. I think there's a lot of innovation left there. So uh, hmm. just excited to see, you know, whether it's us or someone else uh, coming up or dealers innovating in OEMs. Um, I think that's just a space to watch in general. What would you say is a key differentiator this year in, in 2020? Yeah, I think one of the key differentiators and things uh, that are just happening is is what you're seeing where where we can build innovation on top of other resources. And so what I mean uh, by that is, uh, you know, mentioned earlier that the new standard of ordering online and sort of it's showing up with it an hour on your door, you know, that's all all enabled by um, uh, delivery companies, right? That that really can you, you can on demand get get someone to deliver whatever the goods is in our part, in our case, is certainly parts. And so, you know, being able to give someone that experience that you can pay online, you can order online, and it just shows up, uh, you know, we partnered with several partners uh, on that side, and we're continuing to do that. And so, you know, when, you, when you're sitting uh, either at the OEM, at the dealer, and you think about the experience you want to create for uh, the consumer or buyer of your parts, um, I think that has a lot of is the key to a, to a lot of things to to kind of enable that uh, because it's really hard to scale those logistics network all on your own. How's that going to impact dealers um, this coming year? Here we are in December in in twenty twenty one. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think you know the expectations are going up. Shipping and delivery is is always going to be a huge deal when buying online. You know. Um, whether it's the speed or the service level or maybe the price and how you innovate around how you price those things into the products you sell. Um, you know, I think uh, Amazon has obviously set the standard for sort of free delivery. That, that might not always be possible, you know, in our category specifically, but I think there's a lot of innovative things that can be done to kind of drive that behavior. Um, and if dealers uh, and the dealer networks and the OEMs can really get the, the parts to the end consumer um, quickly, I think that's a space where, where we can really win and differentiate because we already have the genuine quality OEM products uh, and parts that people really trust and want, but we, we need to you know fix the last mile problem. And I think we're, we're on our way to do that. I, I personally think it's still early in the game. And um, you know if, if I'm a dealer right now watching this or a general manager or a fixed ops director or a parts director, uh, is there still opportunity for, uh, for new dealers to get online? I think for sure, right? Like whether it's serving, uh, you know, someone directly in your primary market area. Uh, I mean, we only see one out of five dealers really doing something online on the parts side. Um, you know, I think if you think on the new vehicle side, that's completely unthinkable today that, you know, somehow a dealer would not be online in some way or fashion, right? Uh, I think 100% of dealers, you know, uh, are, are doing uh, online for new vehicles. 
and so I, I think there's a huge opportunity, like I said, one out of five. Um, mm -hmm. And and really, you know, one thing I hear a lot as well, I'm just going to competing with the other dealers online. And that's, you know, that isn't quite the case. Uh, we really view it as we're competing against the aftermarket and we need to be visible and and go go beat the aftermarket online. And I think we have a good opportunity to do that, but we need to embrace it. And, mm -hmm. and one out of five is just not good enough. I would agree with you. It's it's the aftermarket as, as well. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of people, not just on the dealer side, but on the OEM side, who watch the Fixed Ops Roundtable. And I noticed that you recently you've got uh, launched a Mercedes Benz National E Commerce Program. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do for for OEMs uh, for OEMs that are watching right now? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, we have some great partners over at Mercedes Benz, and you know what we can do with our platform and our systems is really to build. Uh, a national strategy to drive, uh, to, to uh, use the brand, right? To really take advantage of the brand and build the trust, the online consumer trust, and have them funnel sales down through the dealer network. Um, so, you know, our system, you can do all of the marketing and drive a lot of the top of the funnel leads, if you will, parts leads, uh, but then it's real sales coming down to the dealers. And so it's really about, uh, enabling and i would say really you know take the dealer network you have and maximize the opportunity of all the dealers that are out there uh, that can help you uh, fulfill very quickly because there's a lot of inventory out in every geography etc right um uh, i think oems are in a really unique position with their dealer franchise partners and that network and geography reach they have uh, to win at this game. And that's exactly what our platform helps them do. I think you could really move the needle in a big way for an OEM, you know, with an OEM with hundreds or, or more dealers, uh, be able to, you know, to utilize your tools and to be able to, and to be able to sell. And a lot of times, you know, when it comes from the, from the top down like that, you know, you'll, you'll make a big impact. So, you know, I'm excited for you and what you're doing there. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. All right. So if I'm a, if I'm a dealer, uh, or like I said, a, a parts director, and I want to reach out to you, or if I'm an OEM, uh, what's the next steps? How do you, how do, how do they get in touch with you, and and what do you do from there? Yeah, I think the easiest way, as anything, is go online. Uh, you can see below we have revolutionparts.com. Uh, you can call us there directly, or um, just connect with me on LinkedIn. I have a unique name; it's easy to find me. <laughs> Andreas Ranaset. And by the way, when you go to his. Uh, the revolutionparts.com uh, website, you'll see samples of that web store. Uh, you'll see the Amazon store. You'll see the eBay store. So you can see exactly how it how it looks and how it functions. And uh, great job with that, Andreas. So so honored to have you and happy for the success you're having. Revolution Parts, everybody. Andreas Ranaseth here at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thank you. Well, I'm hearing the drum sounds, Ted. You know what that means. There's only one way that we can get Andreas back to reality, and that is for him to say, Jumanji. <laughs> <laughs>